Advancing Health Equity Through Research and Science. How Can It Be Achieved? Welcome to Advancing Health, a podcast from the American Hospital Association. I'm Tom Petterly, Senior Writer with AHA. In this conversation, Elisa Arispakachaga, Interim Executive Lead with the Institute for Diversity and Health Equity and Vice President of AHA's Physician Alliance, is speaking with Mayo Clinic researcher Dr. Essa Mohammed about his goal of reducing disparities through increasing the number of women and underrepresented minorities in clinical research. Hi, I'm Elisa Adespakwachaga with the American Hospital Association, and today I'm excited to be joined by Dr. Issa Mohammed, Class of 2020 Bush Foundation Fellow and NIH Fellow at Mayo Clinic's Department of Cardiovascular Medicine, who has been focused on addressing healthcare disparities from clinical trials to the bedside. Thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me on the show, Elisa. Let's start out with a little bit about your role and your background and how you started doing this work. It's a pleasure to be on and have a chance to talk with you, Elisa, about this important topic that we as an agent are trying to address. I would also like to thank the American Hospital Association for its commitment to address the healthcare disparities through the 123 for Equity campaign. To talk about my background, I'm currently a NIH-funded research fellow in lung physiology and biomedical engineering at Mayo Clinic. My research interests lie within racial and sex differences in particular, the biology and where they'll begin to better understand pathophysiology of disease, as well as come up with potential therapeutics in the future that are tailored for the respective populations. I guess the impetus in terms of my background in this space was initially from my grandparents. I was fortunate enough to see three of my four grandparents due to a very small virus of the liver, hepatitis infections, that have killed all three many years prior to my birth. However, growing up, it became a constant theme, going to quite a few funerals that a repetitive issue that many of these individuals had passed away from was something so simple as the liver, but never knew what exactly caused their issues, but it was focused primarily on the liver. And as I started to build a path within biomedical research, I didn't know what my PC was going to become or what type of topic I would be focused on. However, it organically developed into going from basic science research to more of a translational research. And I was exposed to a concept called community-based participatory research. And I was able to go ahead and do that research study that never really knew that mattered within the immigrant African and Asian populations. And was able to do research in that space and look at disease burden of the liver and figure out ways that we can better understand disease pathology. So the overall theme in terms of vision that I have in terms of what I would like to see happen and replicated in the healthcare field is that we improve our numbers of patients that we are studying in research so that we can better make decisions that can be informed when we're seeing these patients in the clinical side. And one of the biggest quotes that everyone has come to appreciate or have come seen and I appreciate is from Martin Luther King back in the 1960s at a convention and medical committee, for medical committee, I believe, for human rights. And he said that of all forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. I mean, this is a statement that was made 20 odd years prior to my birth, but yet we're still having it in 2020, is that we're not able to effectively help address the health disparities that we are seeing. We know that there are health disparities, but what policies have we put in place to ensure that we address them? And my vision is that we can address that through engagement and empowerment of the respective populations. It's wonderful. I think the work you're doing is amazing. And I know in the article that I first saw about your work, you're quoted as saying, Let's, your goal was to create nothing less than more equity in the healthcare system for women and racial and ethnic minorities. And I think you're you're well on your way to accomplishing that. You shared already a little bit about your vision. How do you see this really moving from research to practice? What are you hoping you'll be able to influence there? That's the, what do they say, $65,000 question. <laughs> <laughs> 
we always come to work and, you know, we get lost in these four corners, right? That we somehow feel that we're disconnected from the world outside. But in reality is what we're doing here is connected to what's outside these walls. And with the recent tragic events that have occurred not too far from where I live in Minneapolis with the death of George Floyd and the civil unrest that subsequently followed, it's the same conversation. It's, it's a conversation of access. It's a conversation of equity. It's a conversation of making sure that everyone is feeling that their voices are being heard. And they're not two things that are different. They're the same thing that's part of the greater thing, which is ensuring that every life matters. And that for us in the research world, being able to take the tools that we have and the privileges that we have to do the great work that we're doing and involving a lens of equity, right? A lens of making sure that we understand the female biology and how it develops in terms of diseases. We understand the difference of pathology between a person of African descent or European descent or uh, of Asian descent, for instance, or Hispanic. Being able to understand the cultural dynamics that help us to inform or understand some of these diseases and how they progress and why they're persistent within, within these respective populations, they're all in the same. It's, it's ensuring that we can have representation and that the representation isn't just by word of mouth, or we've had these number of individuals that came here, but making sure that there's money where your mouth is, essentially. And one of the things I'm very happy about and proud about with the one, two, three, four equity pledge is, is, is trying to address that, address the cultural competency aspect of it, increasing the diversity in leadership and governance. If people do not see the person that's taking care of them, if they cannot relate to him or her, then it's quite difficult to make sure that you're able to pass the information needed for that person to be empowered to ensure that they are active participants in their own health care. At Mayo Clinic recently, under the leadership of our CEO, Dr. Ferugia, as well as the Board of Governors, have pledged $100 million for that cause. And this is specifically to ensure that we address health disparities and to eliminate racism. This is part of that. It's not two things that are different. It's part of the same concept, the construct that does exist, and to advance equity and inclusion across all male campuses. And that's what we need. We need healthcare facilities that will be willing to, not willing, should, if I may go to that extent, put their resources and efforts to ensure that the patient population that they are taken care of is represented in their workforce, is represented in their leadership, is represented in their mission statements, right? To ensure that if we want to increase minorities in clinical trials, for instance, we can't use the conventional ways of just sending out letters to their respective homes and expect them for, you know, to pack up their bags and come over. There are ways that we can do this and improve this through partnerships with the community and for the institution, not only to be in its own little silo, but the institution be part of the community that they're serving. And this is uh, ways in terms of policies that healthcare sectors or even hospitals can practically implement. In terms of something so simple as language, cultural consciousness, being culturally competent isn't the only respect that we need. You have to be culturally responsive. In a society today where we have various diversity in thoughts, various diversities in immigration statuses, languages, right? It's not a one size fit all type of approach that will help us to better understand this. We have to physically be part of the narrative. We have to be part of the conversation and we have to be out into the community to be able to have those conversations, not bring the community members into the clinic or the hospital where these conversations can, you know, theoretically happen. Absolutely. I think that's one of the themes of the work of the one, two, three for equity pledge is that the sustainable community partnerships to understand how we best as hospitals and health systems are best participating in our community and really bridging those gaps to ensure that we have that diversity of voices. So tell me a little bit more about how your work is really focused on increasing that diversity, both in clinical trials, especially now with all the trials. I think it's you know top story on the news each day as to where the various COVID vaccine trials are and understanding you know, what are some of those barriers and how you're overcoming them related to increasing that diversity as we look at clinical trials and understanding how new both procedures and medicines and approaches are tested? It's difficult, but we're not going to give up. And we're going to continue 
having those discussions. One of the ways that, you know, challenges that we see is the trust factor. Many of these individuals do not understand the concept of using a drug without having some sort of clinical or known clinical benefits. So the concept that you might be given a placebo as opposed to the actual drug, that is something that is kind of, you know, new to understand. So knowledge, what is a clinical trial, being able to discuss these things. And we've gone on several local broadcasting TV programs with various communities to discuss what clinical trials are. We help in partnership with community advisory boards. We're able to continue to disseminate some of this information, what could be the potential benefits of why we should be part of clinical trials. And we even went to the extent that, you know, to help people understand that medications that they're taking currently have gone through this similar process. And now more than ever, anecdotally, people say that certain medications do not work for me. We know about the conversations about statins, for instance, and depending on which side of the argument you know, you're part of, it's either working for people or it's not. I mean, it's the same conversation here. Is there a biological under, uh, reasoning that certain medications work more effectively for others as opposed to uh, not work? And helping people understand that bigger picture is the key here. And making sure that they can see that is a way that you can help people buy into the concept. And I think from the humanistic perspective, and the most important part of it is trust, right? If I cannot relate with you as a person, the idea that I could trust something that you say, especially if it's something that puts you in a very vulnerable position, it's almost always not going to work. And if you don't have, you know, clinicians, uh, researchers, public policymakers, other healthcare practitioners who look like the population that they are in theory serving, then the likelihood to have a communal buy-in is quite difficult. I mean, I don't think there is someone that says they do not care about their health. And the vast majority of us do want to actively participate in our own health care. But how do we make sure that we empower these individuals to get to that point is what's the biggest thing that needs to be addressed. Thanks so much for that vision. I really appreciate it. Now, turning to medical education, I know that's a discussion that's certainly continuing to go on to ensure that residents and fellows and medical students are really approaching care delivery with an eye towards equity. We've seen a lot of shifts there and ensuring that there is a deep understanding and and that cultural humility, which I think is a certain level of openness and being willing to listen and understand a culture other than your own. How do you work with the residents and students and fellows who are part of both your own class and then those you're working with to really understand how to bring that equity lens to their work? This is a dynamic conversation. Um, I think this is still developing with time, but the pillars of, uh, are the same. And the first thing is from an admissions perspective, you need to have students that can inform their classmates to help each other become better clinicians, to help each other become better researchers, to help each other become better healthcare practitioners, the students need to come from different lenses. Each one of us has blind sides. And in order for me to improve my vision or to improve my goals that I have, there has to be some sort of safety net. And there is a safety net with counsel. In regards to the education, as I mentioned earlier, There is diversity in thoughts, diversity in sexual orientation, diversity in religion, diversity in cultures. How do you best prepare these students to understand how to engage with an individual who comes from a culture where it's not common for a woman or a male to talk about their genitalia or talk about their reproductive organs or talk about relations they may have with someone else? I mean, you need to understand how diseases develop and how diseases are spread. But if you go and talk to them with that type of lens and say, you know what, these are the conditions that we see, this is what we're diagnosing you with, but this is how you need to be treated. I mean, it's hard. There's taboo, there's stigma. They don't want to feel like they're being alienated from the rest of their community. Confidentiality is an issue, historically, from patients who feel that they come from regions in the world where if they were diagnosed with a disease and that came out into the community, they were ostracized, alienated. And then on top of that, making sure that, you know, patients who are even American, for instance, who have seen what has occurred in Tuskegee, 
has happened with the HeLa cells with Henrietta Lacks. It's the concept of trust, making sure that you understand where this patient is coming from. A physician might have preconceived notions of a specific person based on how they look as soon as they come and see them. The patient will have preconceived notions on what the physician looks and how they think they will act. So how do you make sure that you make the patient at their most vulnerable state open up to you in a manner that will help inform your decisions for him or her and their overall health care? This requires you to be exposed constantly to different thoughts and being able to look at a problem from different lenses. And in order for that to occur, you need to make sure that you have a group or classmates that can help you understand that and that you are looking at these lenses out of necessity, to be frank with you. It's needed and it's imperative for these physicians or clinicians to be equipped with that because the future is changing. The, the entire landscape, the demographics of the country is shifting and people need to be prepared for the future. And now from a systemic perspective, how do you ensure that? Well, it's interesting. You can build policies that can help you build pipelines that are sustainable to ensure that maybe if a student started medical school at the age of 22 or grad school at the age of 22, that maybe 10 years prior to that, when they're 10 or 12, you have a system in place that will get these students prepared to be successful in these careers. We have a shortage of doctors. We have a shortage of researchers. We have a shortage of allied staff, nursing staff, public health practitioners. It's not a notion of that we don't have a shortage. We have a shortage. But how do we make sure that we build a system in place starting from as early as elementary or middle school that these students are being prepared to be successful and to take those leadership roles once it's their time for them to take those leadership roles? I think that would help us to work towards equity and help us to instill these types of values or approaches. But it can't just happen by just waiting for something to change. I mean, we as a hospital, a uh, healthcare sector, need to invest in these types of fields earlier on. Absolutely. Building that pipeline is essential to our work. And I know many hospitals and health systems are already going to elementary and middle schools and so forth and trying to instill that interest in healthcare. It's a long journey, but one that hospitals and health systems and the entire healthcare field really needs to continue on. So tell me a little bit about how uh, some of your local work in your community in Minneapolis that's really helped you expand your own thinking about health equity. We left the lab <laughs> in a nutshell. Uh, we actually left the lab <laughs> and went out to religious establishments. We went out to community organizations. We went out to parks. We went out to community functions. We physically went out to the community and it was a little bit different than what I was envisioning for what a PhD looks like or research looks like or clinical research in general, but it was needed. And to see my mentor, Dr. Lewis Roberts, who's the director of the Neoplasia Clinic at Mayo, be out there with me and my colleagues, it was actually reassuring to see someone of his stature to be in the community and understand and listen to what people need. That required you to be patient. That required you to show up wherever they wanted you to show up to. If it meant that maybe you would be late and the time was six o'clock and they showed up at seven, that's fine. It's okay. If it meant that the research conversations that you wanted to have weren't had, that's okay. You have to be okay with that because what you're looking for is building that long-term rapport with these populations. And community advisory boards are key, making sure that you have a team of respected individuals from the community, whether they're healthcare workers or not. That wasn't the point, but respective individuals in the community representing the community, whether they're representative based on age or generations or wave of immigrations or whatever it was, having those individuals on the team was key. They were the epicenter of it. And as a researcher, I was just the supporting cast. And I had to be okay with that because the overall goal was to empower a community and to ensure that the community that you're empowering, right, is able to actively participate in their own health care. So this is the purpose. And to ensure that we can expand that into the community, we were able to build a large repertoire of patient samples known in the world. Over a thousand patients we were able to recruit for hepatitis studies came from various backgrounds, primarily of Asian or African descent. We were able to partner with the Center for Disease Control and Prevention to help us better understand the virus and the host viral interactions with these populations. 
we're able to take some of the work that we've done and be able to disseminate it into the community and try to address some of the local policies, whether if it's in clinics, to help better inform their electronic medical records, to flag certain individuals from certain demographics to be screened for these diseases, or take it to public health of the state and even at an international level to the World Health Organization. So this is what it came out. These were the fruits that we're benefiting from right now. And that impacts not just your life, but more importantly, lives that you'll never meet. People who, who you'll never have the opportunity to talk to. Families that you will help contribute towards them seeing their grandparents. As I mentioned earlier, I wasn't fortunate enough to see three of my four grandparents. But someone else, hopefully, can be able to have that privilege of seeing all four of their grandparents. So this is the, the, the need. Building capacity is what we should be doing. And we need to code switch and be able to take what we know, the sciences that we have, the techniques that we've developed, Everything we've done, even from a medical device perspective, I'm part of the group in the University of Minnesota, part of the Bakken Medical Devices Center. And part of the work that I'm trying to do with that team is to say, how can we bring a lens of equity? Everything that you could come up with or look at it from a racial perspective, maybe certain diseases, their pathology is a little different than other, you know, within one population from another population. So these are the type of conversation that one should have and not just in the healthcare setting but the pharmaceutical industry, as well as device tech companies. So we can at least approach this from a holistic approach viewpoint rather than looking at it from monolithic aspect of it. All of us, all hands on deck literally are needed to ensure that. But then it comes down to what? Going back into the community, physically take yourself out from these walls and physically go out. And I don't know how much to emphasize that. And I wish more and more hospitals can definitely help employees become more engaged. And with Mayo's commitment to ending this health disparities and ensuring that we can help our workforce go out and become more integrated with our respective communities that we're serving across the entire enterprise, then we can at least work towards achieving that goal. So to wrap us up, is there a one or two uh, bits of advice that you'd share either with uh, your colleagues who might be interested in doing more of this work. Uh, it sounds like certainly number one on your list is go out into the community. But is there something else that you would share with those interested in, in really doing this work with you? First thing I'd say is look at your own environment. Look at the patients that you see. What are some themes that constantly repeat itself? Assess that. Understand that. Try to go to your institutions, CTSAs, for example, Translational Sciences Activities Centers. Try to go to your institutions, inclusion, and diversity offices. Try to understand how is it that I can improve my patient population in their overall health care. Then you can understand what the problem might be. And then from there, help try to see who can cover your blind sides. We all have a blind side. And you're right, we can't just go out to the community but how do we build the resources within our hospitals? And then we go out to the community as one. And, you know, this is a quote that my dad has always said, and it's like, we have a very small window to impact those around us, right? Mm. And to leave something behind for those to come. It wasn't easy getting to this point. However, do not gamble with this privilege. And it's true. We all are privileged to be in this position, whether we're clinicians or researchers or all our staff or administrators, we all have a privilege to be in this position that we're in. So what are you going to do with that privilege with a small window that you have to leave a lasting impact? Well, I can't add to that. That is absolutely the perfect way to close this. Thank you so much for your thoughts and all the work that you are doing. And we look forward to tracking your career. I think you're only going to do greater and greater things. Thank you for having me on the show.